Hi, I'm Dr. Mia Geisinger, and I'm here to talk to you about filling in the gaps of oral health promotion. When we think about the two main dental diseases that we treat, um, you know, what are the treatments for periodontal disease and dental caries? The two most common oral diseases. Are those treatments a restoration? Are those treatments non-surgical and surgical therapy? I would say to you that those are the things that we do to repair and address disease once it is present. But realistically, the treatment is oral home care. Both caries and periodontal disease are biofilm initiated diseases. And in health, we have a homeostasis with eubiotic bacteria, whether that be bacteria that are um, non-cariogenic or low levels of cariogenic bacteria um, and oral pH and substrate that doesn't allow for caries to form or if we have supra and subgingival periodontal microflora that um, are eubiotic enough and are removed at a frequent enough basis that we don't see uh, chronic inflammation that results in the destruction of hard and soft tissue. We know that when that homeostasis is disrupted, we start to see demineralization and caries formation, as well as destruction of the hard and soft tissues that support the teeth and the formation of periodontal lesions. So if we think about these two diseases, the two main causes of tooth loss for our patients as biofilm initiated diseases, it becomes even more critical that we have a method to manage biofilm for our patients. Those bacterial biofilms are complex. They're like a city. They have channels. Um, bacteria use waste products from other organisms as food sources. And there are over 800 bacterial species that are present intraorally for our, our patients. Um, these bacteria make various toxic byproducts. And if we think about how those bacterial biofilms form, they start to form and they spread both laterally and vertically on that tooth surface from the gingival margin, supra and subgingivally. And this becomes a very difficult environment to treat. I'll tell a quick anecdote. One of my best friends is a trauma surgeon and he was talking about joint replacement. And he said to me, do you know that if we get biofilm on one of these joint replacements, that we just have to go in and remove the whole thing and start over. You can't even see biofilm, Mia. And I said, what do you think I do? Because <laughs> the truth of the matter is, we don't have that luxury. We have to deal with the only place in the human body where we have living heart tissue that's coming through an epithelial surface with biofilm accumulating the second that toothbrush or that floss or that oral hygiene implement get set down. Um, and you know, from a caries standpoint, we have a whole host of things that contribute to the formation of caries, but it's necessary to have that dental plaque biofilm to be able to have that susceptibility in those areas. Um, and realistically, we know that you know, as that pH dips, we're looking at that Stefan curve, and that critical pH is really 5.5, but that's for enamel. If we have exposed root surfaces, the critical pH is 6.5. That's not a big dip from uh, our neutral pH. So we need to think about, there are some patients that oral hygiene is their new hobby, and they really need a higher level of uh, biofilm disruption because of the, um, the susceptibility and the exposure of those, those teeth. So if we have our dietary carbohydrates, we have um, that dysbiotic biofilm and susceptible tooth structure, then we see dental caries formation. And we know that this can be critically impactful, not just for our individual patients, but for our overall public health as well. Approximately 13% uh, of children and 32% of adults have untreated dental caries. And you know, that number can be extremely impactful, particularly if we think about how that affects lost work, lost wages, lost schooling, and um, the overall impact for individual patients and the population. 
When we think about how does periodontal disease form, we see the same type of transition. We see activation of those commensal bacteria to induce dysbiosis, which then progresses through gingivitis and eventually periodontitis for the vast majority of our patients. Um, and we know that that really starts with the microbial challenge and then the destruction occurs with that host immunoinflammatory response as well. Um, so if we think about which patients are susceptible, nearly half of American adults over 30 years old have some form of destructive periodontitis. And those, uh, that prevalence increases with age, more prevalent in men than in women, and more prevalent in current smokers than in individuals with a low socioeconomic status. But the truth of the matter is, our mouth is not Las Vegas, right? What happens there does not stay there. And so if we think about, you know, not only the local effects and the oral disease that is associated with these biofilms, but also the potential systemic effects that are associated with these biofilms, it becomes even more critical for us to think about how we can coach our patients to maintain their oral health. So if we think about what we do in the dental office, if we see a patient two hours a year, one hour for each of their prophylaxis appointments, and that patient goes home and they brush their teeth for two minutes twice a day, two and two, like Chuck Woolery, right? Uh, that patient has, spends 15 times more time at home delivering their own dental care than we spend um, with that patient in our chair. So 30 hours of home oral hygiene versus two hours in our chair, which one of those is more impactful? So why do you recommend what you recommend for patients? Just because? Or is it because of data? Um, you know, when we think about why we picked that two minute mark, it's really because this Vanderweijen study looked at quadrant brushing over time and saw that we have a diminishing return after that 30 seconds. Does that mean it's right for every patient? Absolutely not. There are patients who need more or less based upon what they uh, have as far as disease risk profiles and, and what their um, particular anatomy may look like, et cetera. So how do patients brush? What is our ideal uh, method of brushing and, and what's reality? What do those patients look like in reality? Do you think many of your patients have toothbrushes that look like this sitting at home? Um, that probably should have been thrown out a year ago, and they're just waiting to come into your office and get that free one you're gonna hand out, right? So over 30% of Americans report brushing on average once or less per day, and 2% of individuals report brushing not at all. And this is from a Delta Dental report. So half of Americans have gone at least a day without brushing. And the average patient brushes their teeth for one minute and 50 seconds daily. So if we said four minutes, two minutes twice a day, they're at half of that. That is not adequate to keep those areas clean. In addition, an estimated two to eight percent of, of adults floss daily. And in a survey of uh, dental consumers, 35% of respondents said that they'd rather do an unpleasant task, like filing their taxes or uh, cleaning their toilet than floss. And 27% of patients admit to lying to their dental health care provider about flossing, which to me means that the other 73% just don't admit to lying to their health care provider about flossing. Um, but so we know that our patients may be less than ideal. And even if they are flossing, even if they are in that 2 to 8%, are they doing it correctly? Are they able to adequately remove the inner dental plaque that's on their tooth surfaces? Maybe but maybe not. Manual toothbrushing alone reduces plaque by only 42%. And so if we look at a Cochrane review um, of 56 clinical trials, uh, unsupervised toothbrushing um, demonstrated that mechanical toothbrushes did show a statistically significant uh, improvement in outcomes with regard to plaque removal and uh, gingivitis removal over a three-month period. 
electric toothbrush use resulted in 22% less gum recession and 18% less tooth decay over an 11 year study period compared with manual toothbrushes. And electric toothbrush users also retain 19% more plaque over the study period. So if we think about manual versus powered toothbrushes, if you compare the likelihood of transitioning from gingivitis with more than 10% of sites bleeding to periodontal health with an oscillating, rotating toothbrush compared to a manual toothbrush, we saw a 7.4% increased likelihood. 65% of individuals using an oscillating, rotating powered toothbrush transitioned to periodontal health versus only 20% of those using manual toothbrushes. And powered toothbrush users also demonstrated 50% reduction, greater reduction in bleeding sites versus manual toothbrush users. I think it's safe to say that for our patients who have sub-ideal um, cleaning abilities, utilizing a powered toothbrush can improve their outcomes and their ability to transition from gingivitis back to health by controlling that dysbiotic biofilm. So how are powered toothbrushes evolving? If we think about what we're looking at as our next step in powered toothbrushes, we're really looking at, you know, toothbrush technology that allows for a smart interaction with the toothbrush. An example may be the Oral-B IO toothbrush. This has moved from a, um, a rotary drive to a magnetic drive, which allows concentration of energy tips at the bristles and allows for a pressure sensor to demonstrate are our patients pushing too little, too much, or are they in that Goldilocks zone right in the middle. Um, and many electric toothbrushes now have a application that can distinguish between areas of the mouth and allow us as dental healthcare professionals, but also patients themselves to sort of have a self-regulation of which areas they're doing a good job cleaning and which areas may have uh, needs for improved outcomes in, in brushing in those areas. So if we compare um, this type of novel oscillating rotating toothbrush to uh, manual toothbrushes, we think about 14.5 um, times greater odds of again transitioning to that less than 10% bleeding sites versus the manual toothbrush. That includes plaque reduction and an improvement in gingival health over time. And if we compare this type of novel oscillating rotating toothbrush to a sonic toothbrush, we also see that even compared to other powered toothbrushes, we still have 4.5 times greater odds of transitioning to a healthy gingival state versus um, a sonic toothbrush. So from our perspective, there are lots of options out there and depending on the needs of patients, there may be distinct advantages to using both a powered toothbrush and then even particular powered toothbrushes for our patients based upon their risk profile. We know that our patients, when they brush, may not always uh, be superstars. They may use just certain areas of the mouth. They may, they tend to brush much better on buccal surfaces and anterior teeth than they do on lingual surfaces and posterior teeth. And so toothbrushes with these smart technologies, including an app, can really augment coaching for toothbrushing efficiencies. The number one thing that powered toothbrushes have that impacts our patient's ability to effectively deliver oral hygiene is really that timer. If we're able to say, um, yes, this patient is reaching their timed goals for two minutes twice a day, just that alone really changes our patient's ability to um, make sure that they are, they are brushing appropriately. Um, and, you know, many of these toothbrushes also have things like adjustable modes for, for um, customized brushing and brush head refill reminders so that both we as dental healthcare professionals and our patients get that reminder on when we need to uh, make sure that we're not ending up with those splayed toothbrushes with the, the bristles that are all here, there, and everywhere. Um, and I, I'll end with this. You know, if we think about what is the most important behavioral factor affecting both dental caries and periodontal disease, it's routinely performed oral hygiene with fluoride. Uh, and this comes from um, the European 
both Carey's Association and Federation of, Peri of Periodontology, as well as the ADA and the, the World Dental uh, Association. So fluoride containing toothbrush, interdental cleaning, and effective manual removal, um, physical removal of the, the dental dysbiotic plaque is critically important for our patients. So I think you know, what we need to be doing is think about what are the patient level barriers um, and the risk factors for periodontal diseases, caries, and other oral conditions. How can uh, we then capture the current level of oral hygiene and disease progression for those patients? And then um, what are we doing to have a continued conversation with our patients to make sure that we are um, encouraging and coaching them up for those 30 hours that they should be spending at home versus the two hours in our chair. And with that, I thank you. Uh, and that is my practice inspiration.